going to talk about gardening as we as we get on. And believe me, I feel like I'm getting on. I'm celebrating a big birthday in about three months. And I'm already going, oh my goodness, is it, if it's this bad now, what's it going to be like? But I've persevered and I continue to garden because I find it very, very refreshing and really necessary to my psyche. But you know, a lot of people think you have to be in great health and have excellent mobility to garden and and to, you know, thing lifting things and and you know, there's there's a really good reason why when I phone my nephew, he hangs up on me. But he willingly, as soon as I phone, he'll come over sometimes. So and then I have to explain what I wanted when I phoned him in the first place. So that it's all about communicating, I think. And and I yeah, frankly, there are a few things you need to be able to do, but there's some smart ways. And I know we're all thinkers and it's a healthy activity. It stimulates us. It keeps us moving. So I like it. And my grandpa gardened until he was 89 and my mom till she was 83. So I'm I figure it's 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 got to be. So. Why do we like it? Well, it's a good form of exercise. I really do think it is. And I think personally, it makes us use some of those motor skills that really are important to us. Our hands become a little stiffer, a little hard to use. But when we work with certain tools and certain things, we gradually create, you know, an, envi an environment of we can do this, we'll keep going. And I have to tell you, when spring comes around and I'm back out in the garden, I seem to get better endurance. I think it's personally because I don't like housework and I'd rather be out weeding the garden than doing anything else. And it keeps me interested. And I and you probably would notice if you came to my garden that I have a couple of bird baths. No, let's make it five. I have five bird baths because I like to watch the birds. I create environments so that the insects come to visit me. And I'm a food gardener, have been most of my gardening life. So the first thing, one of my friends lost quite a bit of her mobility. And, and I have always tried to keep up with some of the challenges. I have two wagons, actually. Yeah, I have two wagons and I have one of those big, black things that it it does a great job and the best thing I ever found was when we were cleaning out my dad's garage I found my old radio flyer so I use that that's plant transport that's what I call it and I've discovered by putting a big s hook on the back of this wagon it it's just like a train and I I think that's great and I have a, a friend who for her entire life she's been a gardener and she unfortunately lost the ability to walk but she decided that she wasn't going to let that down but so she widened pathways and she did all sorts of things um you can tell a gardener when they keep the wheelbarrow in the living room i don't think i could do that but you know everybody has their thing anyway she widened her pathways and she got going on you know trying to get her garden looking um looking differently and she talks all the time about wider pathways and how they are so important to her but that's probably because she went out and bought a golf cart so she could garden so she she uses all sorts of mobility aids and she you know keeps going with that and she's worked real hard to keep herself you know you will be able to find extra space and and I think it's pretty admirable what she what she can do. So really, it's 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 uh, just a question of finding where you can go. And and then the hard part is you get to the end of somewhere and you create a dead end. But she says her golf cart has reverse. But watching her reverse it is a frightening experience. So the first thing I usually recommend people do is rethink their garden tools. And honestly. I can't tell you how many times I have um, looked at my garden tools and gone, hmm, this, this just isn't working for me. 
as I've gone along, I've I've tried to rethink quite a few of my gardening tools. And you'll probably, I don't know if in the mulch you can see this, but I have what I call my long handled dibber. And it is probably one of my favorites because when I'm doing seedlings and I'm going along and I'm trying to use it, the pointed end is fabulous. It points right into the ground. It does, it does the job and it's got a little handle on top. And all that is, is an old wood handled shovel that has been created with a pointy end and I can do bulb planting. I can do all sorts of things. And the other thing that I use quite often in my raised beds is this little three pronged hand cultivator and it's very ergonomic. It's just the right way for my hands to work and I enjoy using it. I look for things like my, my stirrup hoe is for longer, for can be used long or it can be shortened to 24 inches and I can use it. And it's literally a simple, simple, really simple screw motion. And all I do is loosen it and extend it and I can put it back the way it came. And I like the shape of the stirrup. It's perfect for weeding and for cultivating certain parts of my garden. It will quite often, I have a few issues with it, um, Deb uses um, a pair of pruners that have um, a rotating handle. And if you are like myself, my hand doesn't like some of the shapes of hand pruners. So I like that one with the ratcheting handle because it turns it around. And if you're working with it, those are things that you look at. And when you go in the stores, do look at things like that. I have discovered in the last three or four years that. Um, Home Depot has probably some of the best tool assortments for things like these rotating handles. And of course, all the garden centers sell some really great Fiskars pruners and they have that rotating handle as well. And several, several years ago on one of my forays into Princess Auto, yes, everyone should go to Princess Auto. It is just even for a scientific reason if no other reason no a research reason we're researching and at certain times of the year they get the best tools in and i found this pair of longer handled ratchet pruners and you see the wheel mechanism up in there it allows it to open up really wide and it gives you better fulcrum for pruning and for reaching in and getting hard to reach i use it quite often on the bigger branches on the lower parts of my shrubs and Deb has this ratchet pruner as well, and it has extendable handles, which I think are great, but you can ratchet it and open it up. Deb, what kind of damage injury did it suffer there where it broke on the point? That's its design. It doesn't have oh. a point. It's, oh, it looks it's like got it's a blunt. Yeah, no, it's got a blunt end on it. Oh, interesting, because I kept looking at it. Mind you, when you look at my little ratchet set, they've got a blunt end too. So. It, it really is quite a, quite a necessary thing. But the only thing is I lost one of the rubber handles on my belt. What this is what I like about it is when you go to put it away, it just stores flat. And I carry around a small tool bag to put some of my tools in, but it works so neatly because it gives you, the ratchet gives it all the mechanism that it needs. So those are some of the things when I look at tools and I'm I'm really really quite um, quite adamant about all of this. And then there's the short handled tools and how they fit your hand. There's ergonomic tools. I like Deb's little trowel with its uh, finger grip and the fact that you can brace your thumb on it. Good one. And these are your favorite tools, Deb. What what are you doing with these? I like this round handle, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so those those are actually from the Bronconier garden. Oh, that was the, they at uh, Open Gardens last year they put out their favorite tools. And the nice thing with that rounded handle is you can put two hands a bit spaced apart when you're you're digging. So you can like it's a short shovel. It it's the top of the shovel comes about waist height, so it makes it very easy to to put a lot of weight into it to be able mm -hmm. to cut into the 
soil or sod or whatever you're digging. Oh, neat. I thought it was like a purse handle so you could carry it around easier, but. Oh, that too. <laughs> Over your ghost, shoulder. Ghost show. But what I really like is see this bright orange mail, old mailbox right here? That's got hand tools in it. So you can keep small hand tools near where you're working and where you're going to dry and dig into areas where you're working all the time. I thought that was a great idea because, you know, sometimes going back and forth and back and forth to the tool shed when you can set something like that up instead of, you know, I always say that my little garden purse does a great job. But, you know, you can only remember to pick it up. So you end up going back for it anyway. So that was a great idea. I think that's that's something that I can work with. And I because I saw the picture of the favorite tools, I put my favorite tools with my weasel. Have you ever used a weasel? If you have trouble shoveling or digging or loosening soil, the weasel is a great tool. But the other thing I've found with it is that it has that wider handle almost like a bicycle but it's reversed and if you lean your elbow on it and put your fingers on it you can grip it and it helps you to get upright again it really is quite a handle tool but those are some those are my favorites so I think that's you know part of it and everybody not everybody but most people should invest in a garden kneeler if for no other reason than getting on it and these this particular kneeler you can turn it the other way up and kneel and it has the two handles to push you up which I really think is important and and then hauling equipment around with it but I like Deb's use she's got her knee pads on and she's got her cushion and she's got her gloves and she's got her weeder and she's out in the garden and she uses it this way because she can lean across it and then push yourself up because I don't know about you, but sometimes I get down too low and I have a heck of a time getting up. And it is really important to be able to use equipment like that. Do any of you guys have favorite tools? I, was gonna say, I also really like it. Like this, this part isn't too bad, but it's really great when you need to reach into your bed and not crush all your plants with your knees. I yes. It extends my reach because I can put the stool right over top of some of the plants and then I can rest on it and reach into the bed to be able to do my work. Oh, uh, I never saw that part. That's cool. Where did you find this one, this garden this needle? Is, this is a Lee Valley tool garden needer. Yes. Okay. And then also, when you want to take a beverage break, you can sit on it and admire the garden and have, you know, a cool <laughs> iced tea or something. Yes, yes. I felt that for some time now that we should keep beverage containers throughout the garden and just a little holder thing. And then you could just move your beverage container from place to place. And then let's talk a bit about, I always talk about you know, raised beds, container gardens. And I think that contained gardening for people of limited mobility or ability to bend, or like myself, if I lean forward too far, I have a bad knee. I've done more than one head plant into a garden bed. My neighbors think I'm very entertaining, but I'm tired of entertaining them. So I have worked hard at finding these. This particular garden was from an open garden a while back. And what I liked about it was, yeah, it's about six inches off the ground. And that was as deep as they really wanted to go, but they've put railings, wooden railings around so that you can lean in, hold on to the railing and work that way. And they've made quite a good use of, for instance, that's a squash plant on that arbor going up and over. So they're using up, go up, because it's easier for you to harvest and you can see the harvest coming. So, and, and even simple things like tripods of posts just around the edges to use it that way. And I really like the fact that if you're out there of an evening, they've got little solar lights around it, which I think is great. And then things you gotta consider. Raised beds come in every shape, every size. 
and things that you want to think about before you install them. Um, really and truly community gardens use the four by fours mostly and they stack them and put them together, but they're easier for the community gardeners to use and they cause less damage. And besides which, I don't know if you've ever watched around a community garden when the guys come in to cut the grass and stuff. A raised bed is far more practical in that environment because then it doesn't take the hits from the lawnmower accidentally getting in there. So it's it's worth it. I have a five foot wide by 20 feet long raised bed and I planted this year, April 25th. And here's how it looked in May. And the thing about raised gardens is they're warmer than the soil down at ground level. The soil at ground level on May 15th, according to my garden diary down in the ground in the garden, was at about six degrees. And that was a warmer than usual April. And then when I got over into the raised bed, the soil went up to nine, 10, 11 degrees. So I seeded. I mean, I've got broccoli and I've got some kohlrabi and it did pretty good May 15th. And I took this picture the other day and this, the broccoli's coming along famously, except where the sparrows decided that that was the snack bar. And it, and then on the tripod, on the trellis, the trellises at the back, I'm growing beans and they've come out in great force and they will go up. Those are dried beans and I, I enjoy them greatly. Um, really and truly that day, that soil was so warm, it was like 14, 15 degrees. And that brings me to, at some point we have to talk watering, which we will, and providing moisture can be the, the issue of it all. And then there's ground level beds. And yes, you can put um, little borders around them just to help raise them up ever so slightly. And these are some beds that we used to have in the old office at the Hort Society. And this was our potato bed. And it, it always produced a nice little crop of potatoes. But my favorite was we tried gar growing our garlic in the raised bed and we didn't get as good a crop as we did from using these on the six six inch high boards and raising them, them that way. And that made quite a good um, harvest out of there. We got way better bulb development from them. And you see, that's what it's all about is how we, what production we can get out of some of these beds. And these just fascinate me. These are knee wall beds. And this is so that if you're sitting on a chair or if you're in a wheelchair, you can wheel up and there's comfortable room for your feet and you can still enjoy the garden. And they're not so high up that you're resting your chin. You're able to rest your elbows so you can work in the garden. And they really are quite the setup. I, I honestly, the community garden at Crossroad has, has quite a setup for disabilities and for hard to move, maneuver. And the other thing they did as they were building, they also built raised beds that you could sit on the edge, see the boards around the top. That's so you can rest on the edge and plant with them. They've used some of the, the uh, metal uh, tray, uh, cattle uh, drinking pet, what are they called? Anyway, <laughs> they've got them and then they corralled them with wood so that you could sit on the edges and use them that way. And here's one of those kneeling, you know, you can get right in under there and you can still work on the edge. And what I really like about this garden is it has some social spaces and it gives you a really great place for people when you're working in the garden, they can sit around and they can join in socially. So it becomes a social part of the garden. And when you're planning a raised bed, maybe you should plan a couple of places where you can sit in the sun and enjoy it and, and get around in it. I thought it was quite an interesting place. And we visited the wheelchair access um, garden at the Cerebral Palsy Association. And they had some really interesting raised beds. I thought these were great. 
Um, mind you, the thing that I was questioning, and I happen to know that my friend Janet Melrose looks after this garden and her students do quite a lovely job, but I wanted to talk to her a bit about how warm this stone gets. But I thought, what a great way. They've got crushed grundle stone and they're using it so that the wheelchairs can get in and out of it. And if you have an uneven walk and you need somewhere to walk, it's easier to do. And it's inexpensive compared to pouring concrete. And up against here, it becomes quite a sun trap. And they have a nice wide lip on it. So if you can't stand, you can lean on the bed and work. And I think that would make for a great garden, but well worth looking at. That actually was a fascinating visit to that garden because they had some really interesting ways of doing their rain barrel and how they collected water. So between that and the raised beds, it was very interesting. And I just put this in. This is a really old picture back in the day. And we um, visited a winery in um, California. And they served, we ordered salad plus the regular. And this is the salad table. And this table was set up so they could bring these little trays of salad and just set them on the table and serve the salad from there. And they, on the plates, I don't know if you could see it, but anyway, on the plates were a little um, scissor and you just went along and cut out what you wanted. They did give you quite a proviso about cutting from the outside edge, not the inside, because that would use up all the lettuce. But I thought it was really fun. And I, every once in a while, I think, well, if I entertained more, I'd have a salad bar table. I think that's fun. And then there's the larger containers for people who can't, really do some of the other types of gardening in their ground. It, there's nothing prettier than for me than a container. However, here speaks the woman who put in flower beds. And I mean, I have no lawn anymore. I just have mulch and flower beds. And I put them all in so that I wouldn't have to have containers anymore. Well, I want you to know that by the time I'm finished containering everything that goes in containers on my gardens, I had to widen the front porch to put all the containers that I collect on the front porch. I extended my deck so I could have a planting. So now instead of having my usual nine or 10 containers, I have about 40, 45. And in my heyday when I was doing it more, I had about 82. So, so much for my plan to get rid of the pots, but I do enjoy them. I find them so, so pretty. And I mean, look at that bevy of beauty of begonias. Those are just gorgeous. And don't be afraid to go from using containers for just flowers. Try some of the larger containers. I, I really like the barrels with the food in them. This is from a garden, uh, yeah, from a garden in Bowness. And I just, I watched the stuff grow up and I finally worked up my nerve and asked him if I could have a picture. And then another cute trick I saw was taking the bags that you buy to grow vegetables in and you plant, you cut holes and you plant your seedlings into the, the bags and it's great. That actually is my brother-in-law's garden and he grows probably some of the best cherry tomatoes in there, but he grows his beans up there. He And he's terrible because he'll cut extra holes to put in the beans and put in all of these extra things. And then there's nothing wrong with, if you can't work too much in the, in the garden at ground level, putting in a, bunch, a whole bunch of small containers. From our open gardens over the years, I have gone into people's gardens and gone, wow, their, bed, their gardens are spectacular. But I'm particularly enthralled with the inventiveness of using containers of all sorts, like this old picnic basket, and using a chair as a plant stand. But it made it that much more accessible for the homeowner who had a bad hip and she found it much easier to garden in these containers than all over her garden. But looking at that, I think, oh, that's really a nice way to go. 
and I inspire myself. This is when I say small containers and when I say to you that I tried to eliminate some of this. This is my back porch and these are my absolutely love them to bits. This is where I put all my herbs usually. I have in the middle pot there, I have my bay tree, which overwinters beside my kitchen sink and it just enjoys it no end. I apologize, I haven't had time yet to plant the big planters, but everything from a scented geranium over to my rosemary, which for the other thing I put some of the herbs up on the deck is it seems to drive the mosquitoes away. And I'm slowly winning the war with the wasp, except that I had to reposition the sage because did you know wasps like sage? So I've had to re redirect that. but thinking that way and then on my front porch remember I said I had to extend the porch because of all the containers I've always had a fuchsia and then I started collecting those pretty little heads and so now they've got their hair and they're out on the table and looking much better but it's all the, in the atmosphere that you create your garden now here comes one of the things that I always talk to people about is because water is heavy and we want to water our plants and we want to water them carefully and we need to stay on top of them. But most plants require about an inch of rainwater per, per week. And an inch of rainwater weighs around five pounds for every square foot of soil. So if you have a four by four square foot garden bed, it doesn't rain for a week, you'll be needing to deliver about 22 pounds of water. I always think of it that way. And then I have my handy water assistant who likes to maneuver and she thinks that I only bought watering cans for her to eat the handles off of. But you know, these are things that you want to look at. And, and you the more water you need, sometimes the weight goes up more, but there's ways to, to do it. And one of the ways that I've done it is using drip irrigation. See that little pipe that comes down into the hanging basket? They need annuals particularly and vegetables. They need shallow, frequent watering and drip irrigation serves that purpose really, really well. It will provide, oh, probably when you look at the packaging of it, it uses, it tells you on the back how much you can do. When you're looking for drip irrigation, there are some really interesting packaging out there and some really interesting, which I will go into a little more, but I find it very valuable to um, check out some of the, the better named varieties of drip irrigation and what they provide, but you can buy them so that they have great, great handles on them and great ways to handle them actually. And it's sometimes a more efficient way if you've got, as I do, several containers everywhere, everywhere. And then containers, particularly water plants in containers, they you water them separately because they tend to dry out more quickly. I, I cannot tell you how many times I haven't, you know, stayed on top of what I'm watering and I lose track of it. And I will quite often, as my dog thinks, I only put the water bucket in there for her, but really I fill it with water and then I dip my watering can in it. However, I've perfected my technique and this is no longer present for Her Majesty to sit in. So it's it's part of it, but you see, she's also a hunt, er, hunting dog and they're trained to get into a bucket of water to cool off when they're hunting. So she just thinks that's why I put it there. You know, it's just part of the game. And then, like I was saying, installing irrigation systems is part of it. I found these Rainbird irrigation sets at um, Home Depot, and they've got great information on the back. They have a really great supportive website. However, the other place that you should go and look is Lee Valley Tools. They're, they have a whole catalog online of how to set up how to build irrigation how to fit it into your into your garden and it is quite fascinating but so does rainbird so looking at that and then this is deb's tap i really like the idea that it has a lever handle not one of those round things because you can open it up 
and close it, it's easier to handle. And when you're doing, when you do look at drip irrigation, I apologize. I tried to get it out of the ground without wrecking it, but these drip irrigations, especially with the red washer behind them, are really good for watering containers. Really good. So do look for those and they will help your container gardening and your ongoing gardening as you go. And mulch. Mulch is really important, especially if you are watering and you want to keep moisture in the ground. I do it all the time um, just because, but as I say, I have no more front lawns. So this is mulch. And I will do things like plant ground cover, which I call green mulch. And that's creeping thyme. <clears throat> and that picture was taken yesterday and it's flowering incredibly. And it's part of my nature thing. My, my bug hotel up above, my bug bird hotel, although I do notice the birds don't use this, but the bees do. But it is all part and parcel of um, how I keep the, the garden moist is by, yes, I still try to garden in things, but here beside my green, my green roof house, I have pots and green mulch. So I've eliminated some of my plants because of the care involved. And that's part of it. But so lighten your soil load, lighten your water load. And I prefer to water some of my smaller things like my tomatoes by hand with a proper hose nozzle. So I look for either, I have a long watering wand, which apparently is lost somewhere out in the garden because I wanted to show you, but I like water wands because they've got a nice spray nozzle, uh, gentle nozzle and you can just turn the water pressure and you can reach right in before you turn it off and get one of those brass on off valves. They work really, really well. And invest in lightweight hoses. They're really, really quite handy and they work really well. Um, really, um, oh, hanging on the back of my chair <laughs> is one of my favorites. These are really heavy duty. I like them because they come with a shut off valve and I like them because they expand and they're light. They're really, really light. So I can put my spray nozzle on, turn it off, turn it on, and it works really well. The only, pro the only thing is don't leave it out over the winter, but they're so light. That's why I can hang it on the back of my chair. But this particular one from Canadian Tire expands out to about 50 feet. And then I can just hook it all together. I make sure it's drained well. And I know some people tell me that theirs don't last very long. But this one's been with me now for five years. And believe me, it waters my whole front garden. And it's just the nicest, lightweight, easy to manage. The only thing is that sometimes when you let go of it and put it down, it springs back. And it, it can be a little bit, it bruises. <laughs> but I am a big fan of any, any of the products from Melnor. Melnor has done a lot of work over the years with watering because they started out in the sprinkler game and in the hose game. So, the, and I don't mean it to be a commercial, but I like their newest hose nozzle with, you can dial it to the nice gentle spray and they can be used fairly readily. What I always tell people is it's the gentle spray and keeping it low and keeping it slow that does the best work. And then self-watering systems. Now, this little clay vessel, I first met them in Mexico, and this is called an olla. Now, an olla keeps its clay, it's usually por porous materials, and I've actually, I have a friend who actually makes them out of old clay pots, she seals them and makes them that way. But what it is, is you fill it with water and it allows the water to just gently seep into the ground. And it probably, you'll have to fill it about every seven to 10 days. And, you know, it gives you a little bit of moisture. There's some really great ways to do that with a pop bottle and sticking it in the soil. I have seen some of the newer 
um, wicking things that you put into a pop bottle that have clay that disperses it with a small pipe and you just put it into the garden work fine but I like the Oya the best my tomatoes loved it the tomatoes root really really deeply and by putting the Oya around four tomatoes they literally went down about oh I don't know the roots were so deep and I never did get them dug out and I leave roots anyway because that helps to rebuild my soil and it helps to get the soil working with all the little critters that live in there so it's an important aspect but these oyas are great and if you can fit um i know on pinterest there's a way there's a thing about making your own oyas out of clay pots but do look into them they really really something i first saw them at this hotel we were at in the back patio and they had them and i couldn't figure out because all that showed was the lid in the soil and maybe an inch of the lip. And I thought, I wonder what that is. So, of course, me being me, I go over and I lift it and I realize it's filled with water. And when I touched the soil, the soil was just the right amount of dampness. So I, I have one which is lost somewhere in my, anyway, it's out there somewhere. I tried to get a picture of my own. Using your vertical spaces, using space and going up and over and doing, um, trying to get the vertical space to fill in. And it's way easier to maintain something going up and around rather than crawling around on the soil and, and doing, you know, it, it's just really hard. And I really like this garden. This is a neighbor of my friend. And he's in a, a wheelchair and has great difficulty, but he's put had paving put in, which was great. And he can maintain his own clematises. He grows along his fence. And I wish I had a picture. I tried to find it. Along his fence, he has hanging pots full of tomatoes. So he grows his own tomatoes there. It, it's quite a fascinating operation to go and visit. And all of his garden beds are up about six inches on ground level below the pathway. And he that way he can go out there and maneuver around and work with them. And these are old rain gutters. And I know all of you are going to go, oh, yes, but what about the dirt and things? And clean them out. But what a lot, nice lettuce garden. That is what it was for. That's what is grown in it. But when you have a chain link fence and you just want a block of it of the view, what an easy way to do it. And you can do succession seating. The middle one was first seating. The second seating was the lower one. And then they'll do a third season seasoning or seeding in the top row. But a great way to reuse some old product or use some stuff that just didn't get used. So go vertical, go up, use your fence, use your walls. My friend Marilyn Wood, this is her garden, and I've always admired this little garden. It's about brick height off the ground along the side of her house, and she grows a couple of clematis that climb up and along the trellis that are placed on her walls. She uses, she's got herbs in here and some flowering succulents, but she's using that. You know, when I visit the open gardens, which is part of what we have as a a member benefit, I'm always thrilled because every time I go in them, I have I learn something new or I see something so imaginative. And, you know, the average home gardener, are, we're very imaginative, you know, and we all try to adapt what we are doing. And this is Scylla's front porch and she put in a raised bed here. You'll see she's using drip irrigation and she's got pots hanging on her wall. And it's just part of what a lovely seating area. And she gets to enjoy her flowers. Great use of space, easy to look at and easy to maintain in my mind. And then let's talk a bit about flower gardens. Whenever I walk the streets with my dog or I'm out and about, I do admire flowers. There's no reason why with limited mobility or with, you know, a little bit of issues, we can't still plant a flower garden. And I love asters. They're one of my favorites. 
and they flower late into the season. They give you longevity. They give you really great interest as you come into September, October. It, it's just to me, it's all part of doing flowering and flower gardens. And, and growing things from seed. This just has, this garden has been around now, I think four or five years and she reseeds it. But the thing that I love are her bright colored poppies and all the different kinds. She's got every kind of poppy there is, right from the bright orange um, I, uh, California poppies up to some of the Icelandics. And her double poppies were are always spectacular. So whenever I get a little down about gardening, I go garden walking and garden touring. And, and I don't find that that's hard on me. I, I, I'm always looking for a few things that I can do. I, I talk from the standpoint of inspire yourself. So I, I find plants, and this is the same lady with the wildflower gardens, but look at her flocks. It's so pretty. It, it really is what we can do. If you ever see me driving by, I will also leap out of my car and take pictures because look at those two clematis. I couldn't walk by them or I couldn't drive by. So I stopped. I, I apologize if you live in Mainland Heights because that's where I found these two. I have no idea who lives there, but I love them. So I thought they were great. And what great color, but here again, they're using vertical space. They're going up with it. And another favorite of mine are Rebecca's, these gorgeous flowers. They have that lovely cone shape and the bees. I don't know if you can see but I tried to get close enough to get a picture of the bees. I didn't do too good a job, but I didn't say I was an insect photographer. I'm a, I like my flowers, so I can't get close. I'm not the photo artist that Deb is, okay? <laughs> so, but it's, hey, that's another hobby that I can do without having too many things go wrong, right? <laughs> anyway, and then, I like hostas and I like shade gardens from the standpoint of as we age, our skin gets thinner and we don't take to the sun very well and we have to put on a hat. Don't forget your hat and a little bit of sunscreen. So once you get the sunscreen on and the bug repellent, I sometimes think we should just carry around a, a thing around our neck with the off and just spray it gently around ourselves like perfume. But wear a hat, use sunglasses so that you can continue to see. But look at these things. These are hostas and there's amazing collection of hostas in the shade, under the trees, and they're filling in beautifully. These great big ones are called guacamole. And nowadays people say, oh, but I can't grow hostas, I get slugs. Well, now the breeders are selecting a lot of the hostas with rippled leaves. And the more ridges in the leaves, the slugs won't go after them. They, they can't climb con comfortably. They can't slither on ridged leaves and they can't go uphill on them because they're uneven ridges. But beautiful garden. The one on the left is my mom's garden. Those hostas, there's three four or five in there that are probably 50 years old. The thing about hostas that I like is they have longevity and they are a bulb. The bulb makes them a really good drought tolerant plant. So when you're looking to change your garden a bit and you're looking for things to put in the garden, look at hostas because they're very drought tolerant even though they grow in the shade. But what a great way when as your garden matures and you've got big trees, putting in a few things that like the shade and look so different worth doing. And here's a little bit of an example of lighter shade in the springtime. And the Burginia are in flower right now, I'm pretty sure in most everyone's garden. But light shade is literally anything between four to six hours of sunlight, and you're still getting that great color. But as the garden starts to get more tree cover, then some of the bulbs just don't do well because they don't want to be, but there's no tree cover. Planting a few bulbs for spring is just gorgeous. But to me, there's nothing prettier than a layer of garden. Like the front layer in this garden from the sidewalk is Burginias, and then you're starting to see the Geronicum. 
and the beautiful tulips, the double red tulips. That's what caught my eye. If you really want to bring color into your garden, and as I get a little bit older, I find that the more vivid the color, the more I am attracted to it. The bigger the flower, the more I am attracted to it. However, there's the maintenance involved in picking them. But what's wrong with picking flowers and putting them in vases? And, and or bringing them in the house and, and keeping them. So I'm looking always for that kind of thing for it. And then another one that I find low maintenance and really easy to grow are the hardy geraniums. You know those things that you put in your pot that are called geraniums? They aren't geraniums, really. Geraniums are the perennials with the woody stems and they grow and creep along the ground. But geraniums in pots are actually pelargoniums. And when I lived in England, I had a, quite a time because they would come into the garden center there and ask me for a pelly. And I'd go, a pelly, a pelly. And then I had to do use my brain about what I knew from Latin. And I went, oh, okay. And if I called them geraniums, even the average person would go, no, they're not geraniums. So these are um, hardy. Most of them are native to higher mountainous regions. They have all sorts of, this one up on the top is morning. It's called morning and it is just gorgeous and it creeps and crawls. It has now filled almost four square feet in my garden under my birch tree, which I'm enjoying. And some of these are great. The only one that I would put a proviso on is that truly native guy called Joe Johnson's Blue. If you get Johnson's Blue in your garden, you'll have Johnson Blue everywhere in your garden. So do watch that a bit as you go through. Bet you you didn't think we were gonna talk about this while we were seniors, but what the heck, to me it's trying to find plants with longevity and things that can produce flowers almost you know, all season long. And the reason I like this particular garden isn't just the fact that it's bright and colorful. I really, really enjoy Maltese Cross. It's very self-sufficient and it gets nice and tall, strong leaves. You're not out there having to tie it up. The wind doesn't knock it flying. And another one is the Native Evening Primrose, which another one, it has a good, strong stem and it just fills in beautifully. And the other one that I like is these beautiful blue salvias. So here you've got a hit of red, this lovely yellow in between, but look at the color scope in there. It's, it's just gorgeous. Now, Dyschampsia, the grass at the back, is actually an annual, although saying that, in this particular garden, it comes back faithfully every year. So looking at gardens when you're planning them, think about, you know, what can I do later? How do I continue on gardening with it? And you're, you're saving yourself time by putting in some perennials. It, it's just one of those many things I like to do. And then if you're thinking the shade in, the, in July, the bugleweed, which is nice, uh, but I love, see how this, the hostas and the ostrich fern and the, the primulas are just filling right in, just beautifully positioned in front of a rock. It is really quite nice, but these primulas are called candelabra primulas. They multiply all on their own. They don't need to be lifted and divided. I find them really hardy. And I like them for the fact that as they finish flowering, you can just cut the flowers off, but you can leave the foliage because it makes a lovely green growth. And it is really well worth doing. And then containers, here I am again, back at my house, <laughs> mostly because I was kind of studying on some of the things I do. This is my front porch and then outside of my front porch. And as I say, I collect the little heads. I also have a thing for succulents and I like to do mixed plantings. This guy is sitting out the way he is because he just came up from his basement hibernation time. And when you're planning these kinds of things and you're going to have big plants like that, um, 
you should have somebody who could carry them up and down the stairs for you because I have to stage how I'm going to stage my garden by getting somebody to carry them up and down for me because foolish me instead of putting them in plastic pots which look great I put them in heavy ceramics and in clay and I didn't take a picture of it but I have two euphorbias which are the big stick ones I have two of them and they're now four feet by four feet wide and that takes my nephew a bit of time to wrestle them out of the basement but those are things that in the winter months I quite enjoy doing that I find it quite relaxing to go down and water and pick flowers and deal with the plants that come back beautifully and it gives me a gives me another part of my gardening going indoors with plants is great like I was saying I move my bay tree into the kitchen right beside the sink and it likes the sink that window because it's cool but it also has humidity and east facing sun so it gets that nice sun and I bring my rosemary in and I do the same thing almost with it, except that it moves into the front bedroom in the cooler temperatures. And it likes that west window, but away from the window. And whatever you do with plants you bring inside, keep them away from the heat register. And you can start building quite a collection of plants and planters that go on and on. Now, I have in my own garden, I have the vertical space. I have a chair where I can sit and look at the whole garden, but it also adds some color to my garden. So it's, to me, having a bright colored chair and having things like that give me color, they give me vertical interest, and they give me a place to relax as I work through the garden and I develop it. But don't forget to use your gloves. Don't forget to wear a hat. Otherwise, I don't know about you, but this is the time of year when I call it no fingernail days because, you know, it's part of where we are at. And this is my favorite view of my garden. It's the bird bath and looking into my birch. And you wouldn't know from the way that the birch weeps that hidden under there right now is still my plant train where I'm still working on putting some stuff into planters and things. And this side of the wall are all my sweet peas, but it's it's all part of what I'm doing. But there's so many joys to collecting and working in a garden. And I mean, cultivating a garden gives us the obvious exercises like digging. Oh, that's a good exercise. Planting can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge, but I don't mind it. I spend time with nature. I get to go out and harvest the food. And I love the scent of things. There's nothing prettier than going out and smelling the flowers and smelling the uh, aroma of herbs as they grow. Um, and I touch things. I, I'm a toucher. Do you touch? I enjoy that. And anything that I can do with my preparation of my garden. I never used to have too many like uh, indoor hobbies, but I've taken up flower arranging in a bigger way. I used to be, a, I worked as a florist while I was at school, so I have that part. And I really enjoy once I get to the stage of the year where I can start using the fresh food to eat. I grow enough broccoli in that little bed that you saw to feed me, and I feed my niece and her husband and the two kids and my sister. So that's what I look at is it gives me a sense of productivity it, it really does and I to do that and to continue to do that I try to take care of myself hence the reason I will wear a hat and I will wear my gloves although sometimes I forget them do you have a favorite pair of gloves I have I have a pair of gloves that are actually have a brand name on them These are my Ethels. They're a little dirty because I was replanting stuff, but I love Ethel. She's a little bit stretchy and she fits my hand and she has gription. They have a sort of a suede hand to them. So when I'm picking things up, my hand tool doesn't slip out of my hand. And I have these ergonomic little trowels and things that I like with the, the bend in them. And I like these. 
and, and my hand doesn't slide out of them using these gloves. So Ethel's a great investment. I have decided that I might have to wash them this year because, well, not just this year, these are newer. But what I do find is that the um, suede hands and tips gather more soil. So I will go out sometimes and you'll find in my garden a little clothesline and I'll have taken the hose and rinsed all the mess off of them because I was forbidden to put the garden gloves in the washer because my husband's work shirts would get streaks of dirt on them because the washing machine wasn't cleaning itself properly. So anyway, <laughs> it's, you know, just little things like that. So think about when you garden, do you enjoy the scent? Do you enjoy looking? Do you remember? It, it's, it's something that I think about. It's why I watch birds. I, I, um, even the magpies intrigue me. And <laughs> when we lived in Britain, there, my brother-in-law, we'd be driving along and a single magpie would fly by and he would salute it. And I kept thinking, why is it? So I asked him. And this brings me back to a memory because we drove through Ireland and about every 10 minutes he was saluting a magpie. But you think about a magpie and there's a little verse that goes with it. One for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy five for silver and six for gold. And the rest are untold knowledge. So when I look at this, I, I think there's some memories. And, and my grandpa used to send me out into the garden and I would remember he would send me out in the front yard and he paid me five cents for every dandelion I dug up. But he also told me if I dug the hole correctly and got them deep enough, that I would find a fairy under there. So it's it's how you use your memories of what you do in the garden and how you look at it. And everyone should have that fancy chair. That chair is the best wine drinking chair in my on my property. And I won't share it, but I will bring extra chairs out for you to sit with me. And it's a great brainstorming space. And from the open gardens here again, I always want to have rocks and I want to have rock plants growing. And one of the open gardens had these cool containers with really neat volcanic rock and, and then these really nice perennials, which I always tell people perennials aren't gonna really come back in there, but they do. She was telling me she just groups them all together and piles leaves on them and then just puts them on the ground level and they get filled in with soil and stuff, but beautiful for, you know, for that person who has that wish to do that and easy to get at and work with. And again, I like the idea of putting containers and putting small shrubs in them. And, and it just gives you that hit of color. And when anyone asks me about growing under spruces, I love hauling this picture out and saying, here's what you do, you put a nice pot and just put something really bright and colorful and that will satisfy what you're looking to do. So when the world wearies and society ceases to satisfy, there is always the garden. And I regard my garden as my sanctuary. I spend a great deal of time sitting on the deck or doing stuff. And I do get friends that drop by and I regard them as cheap labor because I get them to move things. <laughs> so I always take advantage of offers of help because it's important. But really think about what kind of satisfaction you get from the garden and how much time you do want to spend in the garden. I can always hardly wait for the winter to be done so I can go outside because I can't sit in a chair on the snow, in the snow. Although I like to try, I've done it once or twice. My family have thought they should have to commit me when they come over and I'm sitting on the back deck in my parka, but I'm wearing my hat. So remember, think about where you're going to go with this and what you're going to do with it. And I thank you all for coming out. And this program is a partnership with the Government of Canada. And we're hoping to add more programs to go with it. I would love to hear some ideas from you folks about what you might like to hear about seniors gardening. Mm -hmm.